So how many people here haven't picked up their Dells yet? <laughs> Show of hands. Wow. Two. Excellent. I think there's about 70 right now, maybe 80 people in the room, by the way. So I see everybody's kind of staring down at this tall vertical device. <laughs> Show of hands, how many people didn't see the keynote this morning? Did not. One. All right, the iPad demo went fabulous. <laughs> I'm here all week, you know. The hat's right here. You guys get to vote. I actually had other hair, too, but uh, it didn't quite work out. It was very, too much bangs. Yeah. That was the iPad that threw me off, not the hair. All right, I think we're going to get started. Uh, I assume someone's going to turn on taping. All right, so let's, let's get started. So session today is data loss prevention, DLP, and exchange outlook and OWA. Um, I'm probably going to roam a little between here, so if anybody gets dizzy, just yell and I'll just stay behind the podium. Um, my name is Asaf Kashi. I'm a group program manager in uh, Microsoft. I'm a part of the information protection team in Office. Um, that's the team that's responsible, as Christian mentioned this morning, for a lot, if not all, of the compliance functionality, uh, as well as other things in uh, Microsoft and specifically in Office. And that means Office 365 in the cloud. It also means the Office server products, as you know, on-prem, Exchange, SharePoint, Link, et cetera. So we're kind of unified. Um, this session is part one, or it's, session, it's the 200-level uh, session of DLP. So it'll cover what is DLP, what our offering is, uh, how do you configure it, how do you manage it, what experiences uh, you, your customers and your, your end users get. And then tomorrow we have an advanced version of this, which will go a lot more into extensibility and XML and uh, more advanced customization. And there'll be a couple slides towards the end of this deck where I'll actually call out, you know, if you're interested in more of this, go to the session tomorrow. All right, so uh, let's get started. Hopefully everybody knows why we uh, we worry about DLP. You either have uh, legal folks in your organization, of which I have some in the room, by the way. I dare you to identify them. Um, and uh, they come back to you and say, well, we must comply or we must attest to a particular regulation or a business uh, regulation internally, maybe, instead of external. Or uh, uh, you or a competitor or a partner of yours has encountered one of these uh, potential breaches or losses where we see lots of headlines uh, quite often, unfortunately, more recently, uh, around information leaving the organization when it wasn't supposed to leave, whether it's a customer information or employee information. Usually, customer is much more damaging from a PR perspective, but uh, uh, either one of those is bad. So uh, how many of you are already running a DLP solution of any kind whatsoever? Could be single workload or anything. Keep your hands up just for a second. All right, uh, about 75%, three quarters of the room. Um, how many of you have either tried or are running the Microsoft DLP solution specifically around Exchange? Played with it in a sandbox, test environment? Okay, about looks like 40% uh, of the room, just under a half or so. So what we have uh, for data loss prevention in Exchange is a solution that helps you identify, monitor, and protect sensitive information and sensitive data through deep content analysis. and allows you to take a variety of actions around that information to prevent it from leaving your organization or to allow it to properly leave your organization. Now, the, the words here, identify, monitor, protect, kind of highlighted, keep that in mind. A lot of the stuff that I'm talking about will tie back to either how are we going to identify the information, 
How are we going to monitor it? How are we going to do this on a regular basis, ongoing basis? And what can we do to protect? So since you know, I already attempted the demo gods today, I'm going to just jump right in and start with a demo. So for the half of you in the room that have seen um, the Microsoft DLP solution, this might be somewhat of a review. But let's get everybody to the same place. So we're going to just take a look directly at the experience that your users are going to have if you fully embrace the Microsoft DLP solution with Exchange. So in this particular case, I've got an email message. And we're going to use this uh, billing message. And the idea is you know, I'm, I'm sending some credit card information. I'm sending it to somebody that I know. And I'm basically telling them, please you know, buy my airline tickets. Here's my credit card information. Probably everybody in this room has done this once in their life. Um, some of you are shaking no. Those are my security guys there, which is awesome. Um, at the same time, uh, for those security IT admins, your users probably have done this at least once in their life. Um, so in this case, I'm going to send uh, to Sarah Davis. And what you're going to see come up, which didn't come up on the iPad for the one person that missed the keynote this morning, was this policy tip. And this policy tip, here you're seeing it in Outlook. We'll talk about it in OA in the context of other devices later. But you're seeing the fact that this policy, says, this policy tip says, this message can't be sent because it, can, it appears to contain sensitive information. It tells the end user, right in context of what they were doing, hey, you're about to take an action that is not in compliance with what your organization said you should be doing. So it's basically how the organization configured their policies. And again, we'll look into that in detail. Specifically, if they hover over the policy tip, you should see the, the little toast message that says, what exactly did we find? In this case, we found a credit card number. And again, all of this text is configurable by you, the administrator, or anyone who has the, uh, the compliance role in your organization that might tell you, here, these are the things uh, we want you to put here in front of our users. And then, again, you can, uh, in this policy tip, you can also allow the user to say, no, this is the, this is the wrong match. Your, your policies, your, your sensitive information is not properly detecting. On credit card numbers, it's pretty straightforward. We're fairly robust with our detection, so our false positives are going to be very low. Um, at the same time, you're, uh, if you uh, have a more complex policy and you want that feedback from your users, there's a system in place right in the tools, right in the IW's face, right in the administrator's face. You know, we've got all those entry points. And then finally, in this particular case, since we said go ahead and block this if a credit card is there, but this seems like a reasonable use, we would like to allow the end user to have that ability to override this policy. This is where, again, I mentioned this morning, you, the nurse in our drug trial case, or in this case, I myself sending my own credit card number, might say, no, you know what, this is OK. I'm OK with clicking on override. And what will happen is the policy tip immediately changes and says, OK, you've chosen to override this message, even though it appears to contain sensitive information. Your decision might be reviewed by your organization, meaning we're auditing the action that the user takes right where they're doing it. Now, some of you might say, great, this is beautiful. I'm never going to turn it on. I just want DLP on the back end. And we could talk through that um, and what the pros and cons of that. Once the user overrides, they're actually free to send. So we can send the message. And everything goes back to normal. So let's jump back into the deck and actually talk about some of the stuff that we saw. So how did all of this kind of work? What's the, what does the system look like? What are all the moving parts? Uh, question. So I'll repeat the questions. And um, questions, especially around the demos, find it's, feel free to do it during the session. Otherwise, we'll do questions either at the end of this session, uh, downstairs later on today, or in any of the unplugs that I'm attending on Wednesday. There's at least two that include uh, DLP. So go ahead. Yes, sorry. Thank you. So the question was, is IW information worker? Yes, IW is the information worker. Information worker is used uh, in this deck interchangeably with end user in general. So uh, a lot of times we think of information worker as the person who is not IT savvy and is focused on their primary uh, role in their job. For instance, nurse Sarah knows everything about being a nurse and not much about how do I make DLP work. 
The idea is to provide the experience that is appropriate for the IW so they don't have to learn about DLP, and it's right where they're doing their job day to day. Great question. All right, so DLP system walkthrough. So what are the moving pieces here? We have our admin, we have our backend server or service, interchangeably, either one, both work, and we have information workers, again, that, those, those front end, uh, end users that are using the system. The DLP policy configuration happens from the admin side, gets to the server, and then gets uh, shipped over to the client. So now we have policy both on the server and the client, and this will be important when I, we talk about evaluation. The end user, as they're doing their particular day-to-day -day job, may run into a hit against that policy. So as you saw, I sent a credit card. The policy actually hit. That happened on the client side. That did not happen on the server side. So I was able to give the end user the feedback immediately as they're doing the day-to-day -day job. And you can imagine if I didn't do that on the client side, if I had, um, let's say, an unenlightened DLP client or an older client, a legacy client, uh, you know, I don't mean to offend anyone. When we at Microsoft say legacy, a lot of times it's your current release. Um, so luckily this has been around since 2013, which I know might be new for some of you, um, but we can talk more about that in the requirement section. Back to the, the contextual policy, if the policy runs on the client side, the user gets that feedback right away, they can make the decision right away, either override or change what they were doing, if that's what you guys wanted them to do, and move on, continue with their day-to-day -day job. So keeping that productivity bar really high. On the flip side, if they didn't have an enlightened client or they uh, did it so quickly that we didn't want to slow them down, that um, check, that policy evaluation would happen on the server side. For, so for the people who were thinking from a security perspective, you know, what if I don't deploy this for the clients? It always runs on the server as well. And on the server, the bar is more about security, whereas on the client, the bar is about productivity. This way we get kind of the both, best of both worlds. If you set the policy up to be, thou shalt not send any messages with greater than five credit cards outside my organization, the server can always enforce that. Never provide overrides, et cetera. If you say, well, if it's only two credit cards or less, or one credit card only, then I'm actually okay if the user overrides, they can use that client to override it. And this is where that um, policy evaluation happens um, and education. Then that message gets sent to the back end, and as I said, it gets evaluated there for the security perspective, and we always audit and generate uh, the data that we will use for either incidents, uh, incident reports, we'll talk about those, or general end-to-end uh, -end reports. How well is my policy working? How many hits have I had over the last week for my credit card policy or my HIPAA policy, et cetera? So let's step in another, another click through down below. So how did we build this? What did we build this on? So many of you, if not all of you, are really familiar with Exchange. Probably some of you be much better than I am. Um, so we built this inside the Transport Rules engine. So as you're aware, Transport Rules has been around forever, has tried and true, has some quirks. Some of you may have uh, feature asks for it, but at the end of the day, it is a very robust you know, non-V1 engine. And what we did was we took the DLP, the classification, the policy evaluation, and we put it right into the transport rules, and we created it as an ETR predicate. So that means when ETR stands for exchange transport rules, when I evaluate a transport rule, the classic pattern is if a condition or a predicate, then take an action. And then there's always exceptions. In this case, we have a predicate, a new predicate as of uh, Exchange 2013 that says, if the message contains sensitive information, and then you get to define that sensitive information, then take a particular action. All the text extraction, the attachment cracking, all that stuff that we would do for uh, maybe a spam agent or an antivirus or search or anything else, we do that once because we're all inside the transport uh, rules engine. So that's a very streamlined pipeline that is highly efficient, again, both on-prem and in the cloud. Um, next. So actions. What do the actions look like? Well, the action you saw me take on that policy was uh, notify the user, right, policy tip, and block it unless they override. So that was pretty extreme. 
but maybe in many of your policies or maybe while you're testing out your policies, all you want is just audit or alert. So that's kind of the basic action. Again, any action in, in transport rules, this is built on transport rules, there's 26 plus actions or so and variations. Some actions might be rights management. Um, so you can say encrypt. Instead of taking an alert, I'm going to encrypt. And we saw that this morning when I created the policy. Um, a lot of times DLP and encryption go hand in hand for many of you um, because you do want to allow this sensitive information out, but you do want to ensure that it's encrypted or you're required to attest that it is encrypted by whatever regulation, internal or external. Again, there's the override policy, and finally, there's flat out block. Um, any of these click stops along the way, and you can tune that per rule, um, per policy. So you can change that, you know, one, one, it could be one action for one credit card, it could be different action for one credit card coming from a different group, because you can scope your rules to identities in your Active Directory. So for instance, maybe the finance department, it's actually okay for them to send up to five credit cards. Or maybe the opposite. Maybe your C-levels or your finance, they should never be sending credit cards because in reality, maybe someone else is doing that for them. So that would be odd behavior. Let's just block it in the first place. Then you get to decide whether you want to let your CEO have override or not. But that's a personal decision. Okay, so uh, moving forward. Templates. So um, at Microsoft, uh, for, those of you have, for those of you who have been a Microsoft shop for a while, you probably know we really love our platforms. We've released platforms all along throughout time. And when you get a platform, you get all the knobs and bells and maybe most of the knobs that you actually care about. But at the end of the day, you still have to put it together. When we set out to build the, the DLP solution, we looked to build a solution. So not only did we build the platform that supports all of this, but we said, we need to provide you something out of the box. It can't be, you know, we don't expect all of you to be DLP experts out of the box. So what are, what's kind of the 80% case, right? Microsoft loves the 80-20 rule. Um, so we went out and we looked at all the templates out there. Uh, we listened to our customers. We listened to you guys. We talked to our MVPs. Uh, we went around the world to a couple different regions because it's different where you are. You know, Germany might care about different regulations and policies than France, than, than the US, than Canada, et cetera. And we took a large set of built-in regulations and we basically built them into the, the, the box. So we have somewhere around 40 of them in the box as policies, and they're made up of um, about 46 back in 2013, and now about 50-ish, 51 sensitive types. And when I talk about sensitive types, I'm thinking of the building blocks. So social security number, credit card number, those individual units that are absolute, that you might have a regex for. Policies are how is that regulation put together? So when you think of HIPAA, that's a policy. It talks about a bunch of addresses and names and um, uh, identification numbers, et cetera. Um, PCI DSS is a policy. It's combined of bank numbers and credit card numbers. So you're kind of getting a crash course on both actual DLP and how do I implement it into the Microsoft solution. So that covers that first bullet of built-in templates based on common regulations. Another one is we have a rich partner ecosystem at Microsoft in general, and we wanted to start building that around DLP for um, our partners around this particular vertical space, or horizontal space, I, we can call it. Um, so we have the option to import DLP policy templates from partners. We call it from partners, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that you can't Right, you know, you can't have a, a compliance organization internally that is, becomes an expert at what you need and they work with all of your IT departments if you have more than one. Or they're the ones that give you a policy pack that you then import into the solution. So again, this is very open-ended. It also allows you to export the stuff that we have in the box, take a look at how it's built in the XML, and then tweak it or change it and make it your own, make it unique. And a lot of that will come in the advanced uh, DLP session tomorrow as to how do I make stuff unique, how do I customize. And then finally there's build your own, which is I just want to start with a DLP policy that is empty and I'm going to construct it completely from scratch from building blocks of the rules and we're going to take a look at that. So let's switch over to the demo box. Alrighty. So we have the Exchange Admin Center and I'm using a cloud tenant. I'm using Office 365. 
Um, you're welcome to, you can do this on-prem or in the cloud with, off, uh, with uh, Exchange Server 2013. Um, the cloud is already obviously running the SP1 version and you get the latest and greatest there first because it's easier to deploy. Um, this also works if you have a trial tenant. So if you're saying, hey, you know what, Asaf, I've got Exchange 2010 in my office, but I'd like to play with this. I don't know that I want to deploy 2013. Let me go play with a trial tenant. Go online, sign up for a trial tenant. Uh, I don't know if it's 30 or 90 days these days, but uh, you get all the functionality. You get to play with it. You can run some scenarios through it, see if you like it, see if it works for you, and then make decisions based on that. So this is the Exchange Admin Console landing page. I'm going to go to the Compliance Management tab on the left, and then the Data Loss Prevention tab here. Now you can see there's Manage Policy Tips, Manage Document Fingerprints, and you can see some policies here. If something's not uh, showing well on the screen, just yell at me. Um, if I click on this plus, or next to the plus, there's a drop down. So we just talked about these three options, right? There's the new DLP policy from a template, there's the import DLP policy, and there's a new custom policy. So this is how you start. If you started and you said, I know I need to do something about my credit cards. A lot of organizations, the first two that I've seen them do in the US, I'll, I'll speak from a US-centric viewpoint, is let's turn on PCI DSS and let's turn on HIPAA. Let's turn it on in test mode because we just want to see what we've got. Let's not put anything in front of our users and let's understand what's going through our system. Let's get, understand, are there credit cards? Are there, you know, is there HIPAA sensitive information leaving my organization? So in that case, we would do new DLP policy from template. We'll just name it. And we're going to scroll. As you can see here, I've got a number of templates. So let's scroll over to HIPAA. And there's the US Health Insurance Act. And all I have to do is, if I scroll down, click on Save. And this will generate the policy for my tenant. And we're going to go and take a look at what's in that policy that was generated for me out of the box. It's interesting because this morning when I had the encryption, we could talk about how strong of an encryption we had and how long it took. Here, I'm going to blame the network. And if, that, if this doesn't save quickly, I can always open the one that I already have. Yes. As far as when you say review, is, is it quarantining records? Like can you quarantine it? Like in case there's someone in Nigeria and they want to quarantine like So you so you can you can take any action in ETR. So you can take a quarantine action. Um, you can take moderate action. So just like uh, there's moderation DLs where you can say, hey, every mail that's gonna leave the organization but passes this particular bar, I'm going to want this particular group of people maybe to to moderate it, to basically approve each one of those. So you can uh, tie those actions together. Okay, so we have our mech demo one policy, and you can see that the mode is testing without policy tips. Let's take a look at what, what is in here. We'll maximize it. All right, so on the, there's two pages to every policy. You can see there's a general tab and a rules tab. On the front tab, you can enable disable, pretty self-explanatory. You can always import policies that are disabled if you want. And then you can choose the mode for the requirements in the policy. And there's three modes. There's enforce, test with policy tips, and test without policy tips. The idea here is that um, Enforce, pretty self-explanatory. Once you're running, let's put it in enforce mode and let's run with it. While I'm testing, there's two levels where one is if you had policy tips configured in this policy, but you set the test mode to be without policy tips, we are going to ignore the policy tips and not engage with your end users. And the idea here is you want to be the least disruptive as possible when you're trying out, uh, let's say, radical policies. If the policies are pretty straightforward, you might want to say, I want to test it with policy tips. Now, test means that I'm not going to take destructive actions. If the uh, action inside said block, but we put it into uh, test mode or delete, and we put it into test mode, it wouldn't actually delete. 
Again, you're testing it with non-destructive actions. So we, we want to give you all the tools to easily tune your policies as you start rolling them out across your organization. So let's take a look at what's in the policies now. What, what are the rules? So you can see there's a number of rules. And let's focus on these two rules. They're, they're the most interesting. So I have the US HIPAA scan email sent outside low count. And this morning in the keynote, we actually looked at this in the um, uh, Outlook-like or English-friendly view, which is at the bottom here. Now, since this is a full session, let's actually jump in a little deeper. What I just did, I double-clicked on the rule, and that opens the transport rules edit, uh, edit mode. So this is, if you were creating a mail flow rule, in transport rules, this would be the view that you're using. So all of you who are IT administrators focusing on Exchange are probably familiar with a version of this, whether it's the on-prem or in the cloud. Now again, I, I mentioned the pattern before where apply this rule if, so this is my conditions and you can add more, do the following, here's an action, and then accept if, you can always add an exception. And then finally, there's a bunch of uh, particular tweaks or options for every rule where you can say this is a time-bound rule or this, is, uh, this particular rule is enforced or not, um, and then you can say whether or not it's going to process more rules or not. So let's look at the interesting bits here. So in this condition, the recipient's located outside the organization. This is pre pretty straightforward. If you click on it, you get the choices. You can immediately say outside, inside, external partner, um, an external non-partner, and those last two are based on your connectors. We have a full connector session if anyone's interested. So we'll stick, stick with the outside the organization. Um, and then the message contains sensitive information, US social security number, or something else. Again, I click on that, I get a choice of the sensitive information types. This is where we talked about the difference between the policies, which in this case is HIPAA, which includes or is looking for a number of sensitive information types, which are the building blocks. And in this case, if I move it over, you can, say, you can see that this one is looking for a social security number or the DEA number. How many people knew there about DEA numbers? All right, there's like two or three. Excellent. Um, so interesting uh, columns here. Minimum count, maximum count, one to nine. So if you remember, this rule, uh, where my mouse is, I can't highlight in the other window, but it says low count. So in this rule, we're looking for one to nine instances. And just out of the box, our defaults, based on, again, discussing with customers, said that, hey, if it's under 10, we think of it in this manner. If it's over 10, we think of it in a different manner and might want to take a different action. You can create 10 rules and say if it's 1 to 2 or 2 to 5, or again, everything is completely open-ended. We chose the defaults that made more, most sense based on the customer segments that we've been talking to. And uh, then there's, again, confidence, uh, minimum and maximum confidence, and that's a lot more advanced. Um, if, you, if you're interested in that, we can talk about that. Again, it's for tuning your policies uh, to reduce false positives, to specifically uh, identify your uh, organization specific needs. Now, okay, so the mail went outside, it had one or more of these, what do I do with it? So in this particular case, the action that we chose was the notify the sender with a policy tip. So this is one of those new actions we added for DLP with 2013. And there's a number of levels for that policy tip. So you can see that in this case, the policy tip says, notify the sender but allow them to send. This is an information only. This will look like a mail tip. If you remember in 2010, I believe, we introduced mail tips where if you type a user at a domain that is not an internally trusted domain, it says, hey, by the way, this is an external user. Or if a user has an oof message, out of office message, that mail tip comes up. When we design policy tips, we kind of modeled them along the, the pattern of mail tips because that tested really well with information workers. They really got it. It's a one-liner, it's up there right when they're typing, and it's very contextually relevant to them. So this is that information policy tip. But what if I want to do something different? You can see there's five levels for a policy tip. So you can block, just says, hey, you know what? If you're going to do this, I'm going to tell you that you're not supposed to do this, and I'm going to stop you from sending it. If you block, you click send, it'll actually tell the user the reason, and it won't let them send. And it'll give them a little hyperlink to learn more, if, which is configured to your, uh, let's say, your compliance information in your organization. It could go to any URL. 
Um, we can send, unless it's a false positive, this basically allows them to say, uh, report false positive. So yes, uh, I'm gonna block it, but um, if the, the end user says, no, you didn't detect the right thing, then I'm gonna let them get through that. That's kind of controversial. Some people might say, well, my users are gonna game that. And we can talk about that one in a second. And then the last two is to allow them to override. And this is the one that is kind of the most unique to our methodology around uh, end user DLP, where it's interesting because when we go back to the early days of building DLP for Microsoft, we actually focused on the security side a lot more, and we, we kind of thought about that informational, that, that connection with the user. After talking and testing this out with a number of you, um, we actually learned that you do trust your subject matter experts, your IWs. And in most cases, it's about educating them and telling them, hey, you're about to do something you're not supposed to, and I know about it. I'm logging it. Uh, there's forensic evidence here. And as soon as you cross that barrier, a lot of your IWs are really the most empowered to make the right decision. And that's where override came from. That's where you're letting that end user who's most relevant to that decision make that decision in real time. I know I kind of packed a lot into that part. Hopefully that all makes sense there. So in this case, we're gonna leave this one alone and close this policy. Now, just to show the flip side of it, if I open the high count, and this is the high count rule, again, you can see pretty much the same thing, except that by default, we're actually blocking instead of notifying. And when we look at those sensitive types, you can see that it's from 10 and above. So again, the low count by default was one to nine, the high count was 10 to above. This is a great example policy for some of the stuff in the box. You might have a directive say, all right, today we're gonna turn on HIPAA, we're gonna turn on PCI. All you need to do is go create from template, name them, put them in test mode just to see what's happening, and run, let, let the system run for the next week, month, six months, whatever's appropriate for your organization to collect that data and understand the patterns of traffic within your organization. All right, let's move back to the slides. And if there's any quick questions now, we can take them. Otherwise, we'll keep going. There'll be more time later. Going once, twice. One question. Yes. 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 So uh, what I didn't show is if you click on the exceptions or if you click on the predicates, you can scope it if uh, the mail is sent outside and the sender is a member of this group or the sender is this particular person. Or, so anything that you can identify as, an, as a principal, as a user principal in AD, the Translate to Exchange, you can basically leverage it here on both the scoping side of things as well as the exception side of things. Because some rules make more sense to do it via exception, the negative cases, and some make more sense to do it via the positive. But you can do that, and you can have multiple of these rules. So you can have multiple rules that say, if I match the finance department or the business unit A versus business unit B with the same everything else, I'm gonna take different actions. Maybe on one of them you notify, and the other one you block. All right, so sensitive content detection, we looked at this. This is that predefined rules targeted at sensitive data types. Um, there's advanced content detection, and we're gonna talk about that in a second, and then a lot of times when I start talking about this, people say, ah, great, awesome, Asaf, so you've got a bunch of regex in the system. Well, yes, I have a bunch of regex in the system, but I have a lot more than regex. Um, let me actually save that. We have a full slide on that. Um, the, the comment here, the combination of regular expression dictionaries and internal functions, hold that thought for a second and we'll actually look at what does this look like. Um, and then I mentioned the extensibility for customer and ISV data, uh, defined data types. So in this picture, I don't have it, but uh, we'll look at it in a second online. And you can see that there's a publisher on the right side. And all of these are published by Microsoft. Great. But there's consultants out there. There's vendors out there. There's your own organization. As soon as you import these sensitive types, you are now the publisher. You're now these, uh, the owner of these uh, extensible uh, data types. Briefly talk about the content areas. I think I mentioned we pretty much looked at the uh, top kind of country regions that we were getting DLP requests from. There's no other uh, kind of 
relationship to those countries. Uh, we focused on some of the verticals, the PII vertical, the uh, financial vertical, and a little bit on the health vertical. And these were the top regulations, top policies that came out. Um, over time, we've actually uh, added a few more. So we had a bunch of uh, asks between the 2013 release and the SP1 release, and we actually looked at it based on the customer ask and said, oh, this particular regulation or this particular ID number, there's a, I think there's a Poland or a Polish ID number of some sort, where there was a need in that region, in that country, for a, a, an identifier for that for more than one customer, and it was a well-defined or structured data type that made it very easy for us to add. So we are in, we do have an interest in uh, um, adding content to the system, not just features. So here we get back to that bullet that I said, hold that thought for a second. Maybe in the future I'll flip the slide order. Um, so content analysis uh, process. So regexes, yes, everybody loves regexes. It's a number of digits, number of characters, spaces, delimiters, et cetera. We do all of that. We do some... Uh, analysis on proximity. So it's more than regex. It's regex plus something within X number of characters. So I have a certain amount of evidence. So for instance, if I have a number of some sort, but it, I can tell that it says SS colon for social security number nearby within a certain amount, that's evidence that raises the confidence. Remember I said there's a confidence field? It raises the confidence that we are correctly identifying that sensitive type and so forth. It could be any kind of evidence. Beyond that proximity, there's now function analysis. And again, this is in 2013, on-prem and in the cloud. Um, function analysis, the easiest example is credit card. I don't know if it's easy to see here, but I can also show you in the demo. If I type a credit card number, 16-digit number, and I type Visa next to it, so now I have some evidence, I have a 16-digit number, most systems would say that's a credit card number. We also not only look at the, the regex and the evidence, we also run that credit card number through LUN's algorithm. So we have the ability to run through functions. Now you might ask, what's LUN's algorithm? LUN's algorithm is a specific algorithm to run the checksum on a credit card number to validate it. There's a particular structure to a credit card number that needs to be validated. Now some sensitive types have these kinds of functions that we can use and some don't. When they're there, our system can make use of that. We do have that more advanced capability to do that. So for instance, if I change one of the digits on a credit card number, it likely fails LUN's algorithm, and you'll see that we no longer detect it as a sensitive information piece. Um, and then uh, finally, there's a particular verdict. So basically, based on the checksum, based on the proximity, based on all the evidence, you can also then tune it to say, in my organization, uh, social securities might look like employee IDs. So I want to differentiate between the two. So you, you might need higher confidence to actually say, this is really a social security number. And again, I'm using examples, but any of these types would fit into that model. Tuning this and, and really pushing it to the limit that's where the advanced session tomorrow really goes into more detail and more detailed questions. Something new we just introduced, this was in SP1, and this is the document fingerprinting. This is DLP document fingerprinting. This allows you to take a form of some sort or any kind of document and say, I'm looking for things that are going to either contain pieces of this or are going to be like pieces of this. So uh, a common example is um, what would happen if you ran this, and this is an interesting experiment, with, in the US with the IRS form 1040, or 1040EZ, or any of the variations of the IRS tax form, empty, had it create a fingerprint, and then ran this against all your internal storage in your company, everything that's accessible by everyone. It would be an interesting experiment for all of you. I guarantee it. I've done that at uh, Microsoft, and we found that on some of these scratch servers, People have, while they're taking it in the old days to the printer or they're trying to move it from machine to machine, they may have left it or on an open personal SharePoint site. They may have left it open. I'm sure the, the, the legal folks in the room who are responsible for me are now you know, not sitting well in their seat. Again, I'm not going to tell you who they are. Um, other examples, company confidential documents like patents. So if you have a form that you're using internally, if you have a process-based uh, business, a business process that's based on a form or a particular standard way of doing things, very, very easy to use document fingerprinting to make that work in that system. 
Um, and then it integrates with all of the DLP functionality we have today. So we added new functionality in DLP. We provide it in Exchange. We provide it in uh, OA. We provide it in Outlook. And over time, that will go wherever um, Exchange, wherever uh, DLP goes across Microsoft. This is basically a picture of what I just described, um, where you can see on the top, we're getting the template. We're creating a fingerprint. Basically, we're processing that form. And then on the bottom, at runtime, when we see content, we will compare the content, all of the content, to those fingerprints. So we will basically uh, use that fingerprint, compare it. If it matches against with a certain amount of confidence, we can say, ah, this particular one has this other type. Let's do something about it. And the do something about it is any of the actions. So jumping over to document fingerprinting. So I showed this one in the demo today. Again, that entire keynote demo was like six minutes um, with, with the uh, little iPad hiccup. So you may have missed it. What I'm doing here is manage document fingerprints, which is the entry point for looking at the document fingerprints. I've already created one, but let's create another one. I would cre uh, click on plus, uh, test fingerprint. We'll copy the description. Again, this is very, very straightforward. And then we would add the form. So we can add a drug trial form or a demo doc or anything else. So in this case, we will do that. Now, I'm not going to save it because I have one, so I want to show it to you in a second. And all you do is hit save. Now, in this case, I already created one this morning, which is exactly that. Name, form. We're done. That form is exactly the same one that we had in the uh, demo this morning. And let me just open it so you can see what it is. Um, the idea is that any blank form um, works really, really well, but it doesn't have to be blank. So for instance, there's you know, some text in it that says, like, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to look for. There's a table. So there's a structure to this document. And the expectation is that this is the template that will be filled out. For instance, if you're an engineering firm, you might have a spec or a process. Or if, you're, uh, if you do a lot of purchasing, you might have a purchase order type of form. All of those are, make great fingerprints. Now, you can fingerprint anything. I'm just sharing the ones that, uh, when I say they will make great fingerprints, is because the accuracy that we can achieve on them is much higher than just saying, hey, let me put a novel in here. Let me put a short story in here. Because again, you're looking for something that you can condense via a particular algorithm, which again is fully described in tomorrow's session. And then we use that to match it against actual content. Questions about the fingerprints? We'll actually have one last demo where we'll actually see all of this working together. So the, the question was, does the fingerprint work against any type of document? Uh, the fingerprint works against any type of document that we can crack open, which is more than the office types, the core office types. Um, but if you have a specific type in mind, like, hey, I've got this legacy database type form that I'm using, you know, would that work? We should talk offline specifically. But it clearly covers multiple versions of all of the office types plus PDFs, plus a few other types, plus all the text, the regular text and CSV types. So all of those are clearly covered. There's a list somewhere on the web. We can find it for you. But uh, um, if you have some, a particular type in mind, we can talk about specifics. And again, when you're making a fingerprint, you don't actually have to fingerprint the entire document. You can say, hey, I've got you know, 10 different types of process type documents, but they all have this one section that is very common to them. Let me just fingerprint that one. And then you'll find all of them. Again, you can be as granular or as, uh, as, as uh, broad as you want. Other questions? OK, let's move forward. All right, so we talked a lot about the uh, user education. We talked specifically about the why we're doing it and where we're doing it. Again, we're empowering the users to manage their own compliance. So on the user side, we really want to uh, keep you know, honest users honest. It's a very common statement. It is not a, uh, a security architect focused statement. It is a realist statement of the balance between uh, security and productivity in today's world. 
it's contextual, meaning it's just in time. It doesn't disrupt the, the user's workflow because you, you want them to not uh, be trained to always click the yes, always cl click the no, or always click the same thing. You want it to be relevant to what they're doing so they spend the second to read it and take the appropriate action. Um, and it can even work when it's disconnected. The idea of working in Outlook offline, you're running the same policies offline. Outlook checks once a day for any updated policies and downloads if needed in a secure manner. Um, but it can work with your existing policies that were downloaded a few days ago. So your execs that are on a plane, it'll still give them the right cues. Um, and that's important because, again, if you think of that down-level experience where you don't have that uh, or it, you don't have an offline story, if a solution that you had just allowed them to send it and then your server later on said, hmm, no, we're not going to allow you to send it because of a business uh, need, the, res the, the, the way that works for a user is an NDR. And the last thing you probably want is that exec on a plane, just as the door closes or as the door opens, they just sent the important you know, merger note to the lawyer and they didn't have Outlook 2013 or OA and they didn't get that context sensitive tip and they sent it because the client allowed it. But then whichever DLP uh, solution you used on the back end said no, no, no. And then when they landed on the other side of the ocean you know, 12 hours later, they got an NDR and they're like, to, to quote them, it would probably be a WTF, but hey. Um, all right, so everything, all the text is admin customizable. So in some countries, you might want uh, a different text. You might want to uh, specify to say it in a different manner. Maybe the language is important, uh, not from a grammar, not from a, a, just a localization perspective, but uh, you don't want to be offensive, let's say. In certain cultures, certain countries, you want to actually change the language, especially when you're talking about blocking the user. When you're telling someone they can't do something, you want it to be relevant to them. So again, all the text itself, not only localizable, but also customizable. Since we put it in OA, actually let's use this screen. So on the top we have Outlook, this was in 2013. On the bottom we have OA, and we'll look at OA in a second. Um, the first demo I did was with Outlook. The, sec the, the next demo I'll do is with OA. Uh, OA was an addition for SP1. We knew that we were going to do that as soon as we released 2013. We heard it loud and clear from you, but again, from a resourcing perspective, just to kind of let you in the kimono a little bit, we had to choose. And back then, there were a number of features that were Outlook specific, so we chose that. Today, it's in both. Since we put it in OA, and this was one of the points I made in the keynote, we actually get it in a number of devices. Gee, wouldn't it be cool if we had announced OA for, or MOA for Android and policy tips just happened to work there? They do. Wouldn't it, work, wouldn't it be cool if it just happened to work on the iPhone when you have MOA for iPhone? When the iPad doesn't fail, it works. So um, policy tips, everywhere you have an OA surface, which is much more powerful than just being Microsoft-centric from a device perspective. So you do have some reach around your end-user functionality now. And this is, again, all live. This is existing. So the experience on a phone, in this particular case, I think this one is a Windows phone, but it's showing the browser, um, not necessarily the MOA app. You can see that a policy tip came up, and this is what you would have actually seen on the iPad. There's a little drop-down to expand it in the middle, and you can click on Show Details, and you actually can see what is this about? This message appears to contain a credit card number. Oh, OK. Uh, am I supposed to send it? Am I not supposed to send it? Uh, should I send it to somebody else? So the user can reason over that right from their device, make the decision, move forward, and they stay productive. All right. So I think this is going to be the last demo. So let's flip over to, we'll close some windows here. I'll just use my admin, but we can pretend that I am the uh, IW, and I have another message here in my drafts. This is my Outlook, as you can see, this is my Outlook Web Access, so OA. And in this case, I'm actually repeating the message that I sent this morning that didn't actually work from the iPad. So we'll continue editing this. And in here, you can see the clinical drug trial results. So this is the result form. 
and I'm sending it to Alex. So let me add Alex Darrow. And in this case, you see a policy that pop up pretty quickly. So if I open it, and I look at the details here, you can see that the recipient isn't authorized, and this message can't be sent, and there's an override line, and let me learn more. So all of those are configurable. I kind of chose like to show you everything at once because I want to only do one demo on that instead of four demos. But again, remember there were five levels for that policy tip. So we could have done a demo of just information, and then a demo of just blocking, and then a demo of just override. Again, for the uh, timing here, we're going to look at everything. When I look at this, before when I clicked on the, uh, when I hovered on the policy tip, in, out, in OI you click, in Outlook you hover. Again, it's all about the, the user's normal mode of operation. Before it said credit card number, now it says drug trial fingerprint, which is that one fingerprint that I'd configured. So I know why it's there. Now since I, if I'm you know, Nurse Sarah, here's my little hat, um, I actually do want to send it. So let me go ahead and override. If I override, again, since I chose that maximum level of notification tip, I get both options here. I can say, wait, 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 you didn't, you know, this is not catching it. This is not, let me report a false positive. This is, this is wrong. That's the bottom uh, radio button. Or I can say, no, this is a valid mail, and I'm the nurse in charge here, so I'm going to send it. And I'm just going to send the, put this as, well, you know, Alex is a study participant. So we're going to say study participant and click override. And you can see that the tip changes in context and says, you've chosen to override. Great. We're going to audit this. There'll be somewhere in the log where we know that you as an end user thought this was valid and took an action. We didn't block you. And we go ahead and we send. So there you go. That demo does work end to end. <laughs> Questions about this demo? There's a few more slides, and we're, we're at the home stretch. We're done. Any questions on fingerprints, policy tips, OA versus Outlook? There's a couple. Let's go there, and then let's go there. Yes. So the question was, under the tip, there was a learn more. And where does that go? Is it internal, internal intranet, or external? It's configurable. And that's the comment I made before on policy tips being configurable. Let's see if I have an open page here. Uh, I do not. But uh, when you go to the DLP, and I can show you this offline. When you go to that DLP uh, management where you saw the, the policies on the bottom, and there were two links on the top, the middle link was the manage fingerprints. The top link was manage uh, policy uh, tips. When you click on that, you have the ability to set where that URL goes for your tenant. So you can say, for my tenant, I go to HTTP compliance, because that's my internal site. Or I can take it to, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, Department of Health and Human Services.gov slash compliance, if I want them to send it to something that's really hard to read. But whatever makes sense um, for your organization. So it's completely configurable. And that's one of those key things. When we built it, we built it both as a platform and as a solution end to end. Does that answer the question? Okay. That's an interesting one. Um, so the question was, how do you keep the nurse from doing that 20, 30 times a day? That's right. So one of the interesting things, and actually, let's, if that was the last question for this section, I'll actually flip to the next slide, which will help me answer that. So this is how you keep the nurse from, from doing that. Here's an example of DLP reporting and auditing. If the nurse... Uh, if one user or any number of users or any groups of users are going to override um, or, let's say, report false positive 20, 30 times a day, that may say that the nurse thinks that this is uh, the wrong policy for her or for her role or for his role, whoever it is. Um, that report and a number of other reports along with that will show you as both the IT admin or the compliance officer that looks at those that your policy needs to be tuned. So the short answer to that would, have, would be you tune the policy. You say that uh, nurse in charge group never gets this violation. They only get it if they send two of them or three of them in one mail. Because generally their day to day is I run the study, I get results, I send results to the participant. If that's the pattern, that's a very easy pattern to just say that's appropriate for any nurse 
uh, anybody have a role, nor role nurse or in an Active Directory group that contains all the right people there? So if you can define the pattern very easily from a business perspective, it's probably best to tune your policy. If you cannot define the, the, the pattern, that's where, you're, that's where you're allowing override and allowing the end user to decide. Over time, we expect and we've seen customers tune their policies to allow the, the functions that people do on a regular basis not be exception, but be the default. Again, even if you allow that to go out for the nurses without blocking them or causing them to override, you can still show an information tip or you can not show anything and just audit it from a DLP perspective on the back end. And that might be appropriate for this particular scenario, meaning the nurse can always send uh, uh, trial results and it's always audited and they never get anything in their face. But if uh, somebody else tries to send it out, let's say accounting tries to send out trial results, that's a no-no and maybe we do an override or maybe we just block all up. Does that give you an idea? There is no, if you were looking for, I know, I know potentially what some people are looking for. If you were looking for, remember my last action and just repeat it? That's generally not, we haven't found that to be very useful in a compliance scenario because if the user all of a sudden says, checkbox, just do what I've done before, you probably need to talk to some of your internal folks to say, does that actually meet my compliance needs moving forward? We can take, we can take that in more detail if there's more around that uh, later on. Okay, so uh, DLP reporting and auditing. Everything is audited by default. Um, you can be explicit about certain things. You can say, I'm looking for other things. I'm looking for hits. I'm looking for overrides. Um, you can drill into individual rules. You can drill into uh, different groups. Um, you can take out all the data. You can say, give me the data for the last week, and I'm going to analyze it in Excel because I love pivot tables. That is my favorite thing in the world, and I'm going to do that analysis myself. Feel free to, to kind of work with, with, with a system as best as it works for you. Another item that we do um, is incident management, uh, incident reports. So we have a new action. Besides that policy tip, we have an action called GIR, Generate Incident Report. And the idea with that is that if a rule, a DLP rule hit, that is the equivalent of an incident from a compliance perspective. We're just calling it an incident, no alarm needed. But you can send it to anything. You can send it to a person. You can send it to a ticketing system. You can send it to, um, you can tie it into other systems. And it can include as much or as little of the information of that incident in that email. Uh, Jack's going to show that tomorrow in that session. And there's the, I promised you in the last couple of slides, I would highlight things that are going to go deeper in that session. So in the advanced data loss protection tomorrow, you'll see what incident reports look like. Basically, a copy of the message plus a whole lot of data or as little data as you want. Again, fully configurable. Extensibility points. We kind of touched on these across the entire session. So we talked about custom DLP content, right? So we are providing features. We are providing content. We also have partners, as well as yourself, who can provide your own content. You can extend it. On the right, see a bunch of gibberish. No, I'm kidding. It's, it's all XML. This is you know, defining the policy. You can probably parse it because of the, hopefully, the nice color coding here, where you can see the number of matches, the evidence, um, the confidence level, et cetera. So this is what one of these looks like. And you can pull out the ones that we have in the system. And if you're comfortable enough with an XML editor or even a regular editor, you can go and tweak them and change them directly if you're not doing it from, uh, from the UI in certain cases. Or you can create new ones. Or you can go to a third-party consultant who's an expert at, uh, I don't know, uh, Japanese healthcare regulation, which you just expanded your company into Japan, and you might need something that we didn't put in the box, potentially. Go talk to them, have them create you the right regulation uh, policy, and you can just one-click import, or you can give them you know, a, a delegated admin account to your tenant and have them do that on your behalf directly. So that's one extensibility point. Incident reports we talked about with custom workflows, uh, and then other custom reporting uh, solutions. And for instance, after we released 2013, um, Dell, with their message stats product, which used to be from Quest originally, um, actually en enhanced. They have a, an exchange uh, on-prem solution for reporting. They enhanced it by adding DLP reports right in there. So we've got a number in the cloud. They added a number on-prem. It's all available 
Um, and if you wanted to create your own or you have your favorite PowerShell or other scripting, again, you can do that. Uh, all of this extensibility, deep dive tomorrow in the advanced uh, data loss prevention. Finally, just kind of wrapping it up, the white part, the two left columns, cover the stuff that was released with 2013. <clears throat> so if you're running Exchange 2013 today, you get all of this. If you're running Outlook 2013, you also get the policy tips and the user education there. With SP1, both around the SP1 timeframe in the cloud, meaning today, as well as when it released and you deployed it on-prem, you also get the policy tips in OA and mobile OA. You get the fingerprinting experiences across all of these. And then you also get the out-of-box sensitive information. We have five more. And I mentioned the, uh, the Poland one, but there's a number of others. We're always open to feedback, both on the feature side as well as on the content side. So if you're, uh, let's say you're a consultant and you're working with a customer in some region and you really need a particular policy or a particular sensitive type that you think is useful for that entire region or you think it's useful for lots of your customers, feel free to send it our way. Feel free to have that conversation. Let's figure out what we can do and where we can drop it. Now, in the cloud, I get to update this every two weeks. So as we build the features, as we create new content, I get to roll it out. Again, it starts very slow, and it expands from the number of tenants. So we don't want to blast everybody with new content. We slowly roll it out. But at the end of the day, we roll it out much faster than on-prem. At the same time, we provide all of this over time on-prem. So whenever the next on-prem releases, the next CU, generally we don't release features until big releases, but content can always be uh, added over time in smaller chunks. All right, with that, uh, there's a slide for the appendix for you, know, for you to click on a bunch of links and get some uh, intros, walkthroughs, policy templates. If you uh, get an office demo, a trial tenant set up, an E3 above tenant, um, you get all of this. You get to play with all of this. There are guides that walk you through step by step. Everything that I showed you, you can probably do yourself via those guides. Um, I don't know if our fingerprinting uh, walkthroughs are up there, but the fingerprinting uh, TechNet articles are. Uh, Q&A, and oh, that's a new one. Pre-release programs team. Interesting. Um, I knew about this one. So like Quentin said, if you thought this was great, please rate it. If you thought this sucked, please rate it. Um, this is the way we get feedback. Um, comments are wonderful. If you thought, I should never use an iPad, or I should wear other wigs, feel free. You know, I will read everything. If you have questions, uh, go up to the mic, uh, raise your hand. We can just talk it through. I think we have a number of, let's see, we have about 10 minutes or so uh, before we're done. And then I'll also be here uh, at the Wednesday sessions. I'm here through Wednesday night, basically. So I'll be here at the Wednesday unplug sessions. There's two of them officially that include DLP. Um, I'll also be in the encryption one if that, if that is your fancy. Question there, question there. Uh, yes? Two questions. It works. Uh, that's a great question. Does it work against calendar appointments? I believe it works. For some reason, there's a bug that sticks in my head with some particular appointments. But I believe it works against any mail item. So we should be able to get that. The, what gets parsed out of those is the thing that kind of sticks in my mind. So if you want to give me your name afterwards, we can chat or we can post something uh, to the forums, et cetera. There, there's, we can make sure we look it up. Uh, so uh, the question was, how many rules should we set up? So we have, it's interesting, because this is built on top of transport rules. So we do not have any DLP, any unique DLP guidance that increases or decreases the transport rule. The generic uh, uh, rule of thumb or the guidance, the limits that we advertise today uh, for transport rules is 100 per tenant in the cloud and unlimited on-prem. That's, that's kind of the guidance. Um, from a performance perspective, we have made this extremely performant. Yes, there is a cost. Anytime you're doing more, there's a cost. But it is extremely performant because we don't, uh, unlike other DLP solutions, we're already taking advantage of the fact that we crack open the, the content and the attachments. And that actually is the most expensive operation when you do a DLP operation. It's parsing and tokenizing the content itself. 
And once you're doing that for spam, AV, anything else, search, if you can piggyback on that and do this analysis, it's, it's, very, uh, it's relatively inexpensive, let's call it that. So right now on-prem, I've, I've run into companies that have had hundreds of rules. Um, I've not run into companies that said, this slowed me down to the point where X happened. Um, in the cloud, I have run into companies where uh, super, super large companies, usually post-migration, that came from multiple places that they ran into our 100 rule limit. We engage with them, we give them feedback, they, we point them to our documentation, and I've not found a company that was not able to collapse rules into under 100 because the transport rules are so flexible and are able to handle multiple cases per rule. Whereas if you think of, uh, I'll give our own example, not competitors, if you think of FOPI, Forefront Online Protection for Exchange, some of the rule creation there was one IP per rule, not necessarily because you had to, but because that's how people used to do it. So when you collapse that, you can actually collapse it into one transport rule for a whole lot of those. Does that make sense? I kind of answered a little more. There was a question back there. That? Okay. Pictures. And I think somebody on the left, on my left, also wanted to take a picture of that. They can. Uh, question up front. Correct. So the question was, if somebody encrypted a zip file, um, so short answer, no, we do not uh, hack a zip password, even though zip passwords are probably one of the easier ones to hack if you really wanted to. Um, the, in, the way we, we solve that is for all, uh, we generalize it into unknown types. You can create one or many rules that say, if you, the system, the DLP system, cannot inspect this file, then take this action. So you can say by default, if somebody takes, because what if, what if I cracked zip, but then they use RAR? Or what if I crack zip, zip and RAR and they use some other, you know, they use PGP? You can basically say, look, I don't expect my users to use opaque blobs of any kind that I don't understand. Or if they do, it's such a small percentage that I expect to be able to uh, uh, review them manually or to take some other kind of action, quarantine it. So we provided you with a, with a predicate to basically say, if you don't understand this file or you can't scan it, put it in this other category and take a different set of action or any kind of action that you'd like. So that solves, uh, for most of the customers that I've talked to, that solves their, their protected zip uh, concerns. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy to listen to new scenarios in that space. Does that cover that question? Perfect. Uh, other questions? Anyone? Yes. Yes. So when they're downloaded, they are stored in the local um, app data, I think it's the uh, local app data cache directory uh, for Outlook. Um, the part of it is encrypted, part of it is not. So if you had encrypted policies, we would keep them there encrypted. But in general, if the policies are available, over the wire unencrypted, then we just store it unencrypted because there's no secrets, there's no secrets in there. Um, and that's just stored there for convenience and Outlook is able to basically, um, quote unquote, take a fingerprint of that and compare it with the server, check some it against the server to know when to get refreshes on a regular basis. Other questions, anyone? Yes. Okay, so the question was delegation. Um, so you can use uh, the RBAC delegation of uh, Exchange Admin Console and provide different roles. So you might have an admin that only manages this but doesn't manage uh, user creation, for instance. So you can give that to the compliance officer. The other thing that I did not show in this session, uh, but we've got a number of sessions that briefly touch on it, is that Unified Compliance Center. So we announced the Unified Compliance Center uh, around the SharePoint conference time. And this is that one place that we're all, this entire org that I'm a part of is moving towards. And a lot of our solutions will manifest there. So this, excuse me, this morning um, in the keynote, when I started, I started from the Unified Com Compliance Console, um, Compliance Center. And if you look on the left, the tabs were different than what the Exchange Admin Center were, but the DLP functionality was very similar. 
So you can actually manage DLP from there. Our vision moving forward, why is that relevant, is that you could give a compliance officer or an IT pro who belongs, work for a compliance office type of environment, um, access to the Unified Compliance Center, and all the actions that they would do there are relevant to their job. Again, this is a forward-looking statement. Unified Compliance Center is not available for you yet, um, but hopefully, you know, over the near term, you'll start seeing pieces of it. And it's a statement that we are looking to uh, put all of that, to centralize all of those operations there without necessarily ripping it all out from your individual workloads, right? So you can still do it in exchange. If you're a messaging journalist, or an IT generalist, and you're doing everything from the Exchange Console and the SharePoint Console, and you don't care about anything else, you can continue to do all of that from there. Some of these more advanced operations, some of these places where it makes sense to put, uh, like Unified Hold is a great example. If you put something on hold and you want it to just work across all your workloads, why should you manage these things in multiple places? More of those scenarios will end up in this unified place, and then once you have them there, those are relevant actions for the CISO or the Compliance Office team to delegate access to? You got the short and the long answer. Okay, other questions? All right, I'll still be around here, and again, my team and I are gonna be around on Wednesday. Thank you, everyone. Please fill out the evaluations.